All right, hello and good morning. Thank you to those of you who took part in our breakout sessions to network and get to know some of your fellow Alaska Business Forum attendees today. So good to see you all. What a week, we're almost there, it is Thursday. Um, I'm Betsy with the Seattle Metro Chamber. And just really quick, we had a few housekeeping things before we get started. Um, as you'll note, we are in a Zoom meeting today, so you are all, you have the opportunity to be on video if you'd like to be, um, and uh, you can feel free to mute and unmute yourself if you have a question later on this afternoon. Um, and just a note that we do not have a Q&A box today, so if you have a question, please do let us know in the chat, and we will call on you live during that Q&A portion at the end of our meeting. So that is all I have for housekeeping. Without further ado, I would like to welcome George Rowe, our Alaska Business Forum Chair and MC to take us away, George. Thanks very much, Betsy, and good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Alaska Business Forum. Uh, as Betsy noted, my name is George Rowe. I am the chair for the forum and your MC today. Uh, my day job, I'm the director for the Arctic Energy Office at the Department of Energy uh, on loan from the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Today's program is a topic area that's super important uh, in the state and are much more broadly. Uh, it's the status of oil and gas production. These industries have been spotlighted by the national news lately. Uh, we'll kind of address some of that as we come along today. Uh, especially following this week's election, there are possibly some serious impacts and changes uh, that uh, could trend in different directions. And we're gonna hear about uh, some of those uh, from our speakers. Before we forge into the conversation, that, that conversation, that I want to thank our series sponsor, Alaska Airlines. Uh, Scott Haberstadt, who's usually with us at these forums, it's called away, couldn't be here to give his usual opening remarks, but we do want to just make sure uh, that uh, Alaska Airlines knows how much we appreciate their uh, participation in the forum uh, and their sponsorship of these series. And, and for providing safe travel throughout our region. Uh, it's my, my wife just threw a lot, flew Alaska Airlines uh, uh, earlier today or yesterday. So thank you. Uh, I'm gonna introduce the speakers. Uh, today, we're going to have a, a collaborative effort where the two speakers interact with one another rather than following uh, uh, one after the other. And we'll have a, a group conversation after that. So I, I want to, uh, make sure that we do acknowledge that uh, the whole topic of energy, oil and gas, it, it can be controversial. And at the, the Alaska Business Forum, we, we welcome topics of this nature because we're here uh, first and foremost to make sure that we've, we've got the most recent data, uh, that we understand the topic areas. And I'd ask that all of us be careful and respectful in any comments that we make, whether it's in the chat or verbally, and uh, seek, seek first to understand, uh, as the saying goes. So without further ado, let me introduce our speakers, Brooke Ivey and Christine Ressler. Uh, first of all, Brooke, she's the uh, External Affairs Manager at the Alaska Oil and Gas Association. She's a third generation Alaskan. She was born and raised in Anchorage where she attended uh, Diamond High. She's a product of the city's Japanese partial immersion program, interestingly. Uh, graduated from Willamette in Salem and she was a Mark uh, Hetfield scholar there with a degree in Japanese studies. She later went to live and work in Japan. Before joining uh, Oil and Gas Association, she served four years of staff in the state legislature. So she's very tuned into the, some of the topics that we're dealing with right now in the election thing, where she had a focus on natural resources and oil and gas tax policy. Uh, her prior work experience also includes roles as a campaign manager uh, as an assistant director for the Visions Meeting and Event Management uh, Organization. She's a certified resource specialist for United Way's 211 program. And she's a grants administrator. She was a, a grants administrator for Covenant House Alaska, uh, right there in Anchorage. Uh, she's a member of the Public Relations Society of America, and she's a co-founder of the Jewel Lake Farmers Market. So pretty, pretty broad and deep kind of uh, background there. So welcome, Brooke. Christine uh, Ressler, she is the president and CEO of uh, Arctic Slope uh, Regional Corporation or ASRC Energy Services. She's got over 20 years of experience in finance, technology development, and senior management uh, leadership roles. 
Her focus is on ensuring that the services they offer are delivered with the highest attention to safety, quality, and excellence. Prior to her service there at ASRC, Christine managed Schlumberger's Alaska operations. She served in various uh, Schlumberger management roles prior to that, including Director of Mergers, Acquisitions, and New Ventures. She was the Vice President of Advanced Technologies within the Smith Fit segment and the Katy Technologies Center Manager. Uh, in that latter capacity, she managed drilling motors and land-based directional uh, portfolio uh, elements. She's a wife, she's a mother of three teenagers, and in, she enjoys Pilates, endurance horseback riding, fly fishing, skiing, cooking, and gardening. Thanks so much uh, for joining us. Brooke and Christine, please take it away. All right, thank you so much uh, for having us here today. I'm Brooke Ivey with the Alaska Oil and Gas Association. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started. I'll share um, our screen here. Can everyone see that okay? Okay, great. So today, um, as, as George mentioned, uh, Christine and I will be kind of going back and forth a little bit, but we plan to cover, you know, the economic impact uh, for Alaska of the Alaska oil and gas, or excuse me, the oil and gas industry. Um, and, and there's a ballot measure, Alaska ballot measure one, uh, results are just coming in, of course, but we'll speak to, I will speak to the potential impacts of that and how those results are looking as well. Um, global market outlook, and then the path forward for Alaska's industry. And then lastly, Christine will also cover um, the impact of COVID-19 pandemic has had so far on operations and how the industry has responded. So just starting out with economic impact to give a big picture view of really what the oil and gas industry means to Alaska. Um, and sometimes, you know, as someone who was born and raised in Alaska, didn't have family working directly in industry, I understand it can be really easy to forget um, that, that uh, really in full impact that oil and gas industry has on the quality of our everyday lives here, but it is significant. I'll just give a few uh, details. Um, these come from the McDowell Group. It's a research agency that we work with every few years to assess the economic impact. And in their January 2020 report, they stated Alaska's oil and gas industry remains the single most important economic engine in the state. And really, here's why. So you've, in 2018, which is the most recent data that we have um, compiled, um, over 77,000 jobs and 4.8 billion in Alaska wages came from the industry. Um, in annually, uh, the industry spends about $4.4 billion with a thousand Alaskan businesses. And, you know, so together that's a combined impact of about $9 billion in the private sector alone. And, and these aren't, when I say Alaska businesses, these aren't just typical oil and gas businesses that you think of like engineering and construction firms, but secondary businesses like restaurants and hotels that benefit from the industry activity in our state. And finally, um, you know, in 2018, 3.1 billion uh, went from state and local governments um, paid by the industry through taxes and royalties. So it is a significant impact. So just to expand on the job piece, uh, which I referenced in the last slide, um, excuse me, um, as mentioned, so over 77,000 jobs and 4.8 billion in wages are um, as a result of, of come from the oil and gas industry. So that's about one quarter of all Alaska jobs and 27% of all wages in the state. And for each oil and gas job that supports or creates 15 additional jobs. So for every primary company job, eight additional jobs are associated with spending by industry companies, as well as seven jobs are associated with oil um, taxes and royalties that go to the state of Alaska and support those positions. And for every dollar uh, earned by a primary company, employee generates four additional indirect and induced wage dollars. So um, that's just kind of a broad picture of the impact that um, it permeates our, our state here. Now looking to, um, to state and local revenue, uh, as you can see in fiscal year 2019, which is the last year that we have actuals for, uh, the oil and gas industry paid 
um, zero seven billion dollars, and that's not including federal taxes. Of course, that's just to the state and local governments. Um, and and this kind of gives you a picture of the types of um, taxes and royalties that exist uh, here in the state. But this amount right now, um, oil and gas accounts for 90% of all revenue to the state from business. And so while those while the amounts fluctuate with oil price, of course, it's a significant contribution um, to the state and supporting essential services like public safety and roads and education, and is a cornerstone of our budgeting here. Um, now, I will say 25 per, per our constitution, 25% of all royalties from each barrel of oil go to, uh, goes to the Alaska Permanent Fund, which you've probably heard of, um, and that helps generate interest income. Um, and since 1977, when the Trans-Alaska Pipeline has come online, we've actually contributed 20 billion, nearly $20 billion to that permanent fund, uh, which has now grown with interest earnings to over 65 billion. Um, so it's a very um, unique structure and significant to the state and we're happy to contribute to that. Um, and as you can see, I'll just quickly touch on this. So you can see uh, at the bottom there got kind of cut off, but royalties to the permanent fund are in that light green. Uh, royalties to the general fund are in that darker green and that is representative of essentially our spending money for the state budget. Um, corporate income tax as well in the gold uh, which is contributed, you know, depending that fluctuates, of course, with oil price and earnings. Um, production tax is also based on the barrel, just like royalties. Um, property tax, though, to state and local, that is irrespective of oil price, and that is always paid um, at sort of a flat rate of 20 mils to local governments and to the state as well. So uh, I'd like to talk now about ballot measure one um, and its potential impact on the state economy. First, I'll talk a little bit about so what the ballot measure did. Um, there was actually quite a bit in, in the ballot measure, um, but the main, the main element was the tax increase. So it would raise production taxes by 150 to 300 percent in a single year. It was targeted it's a targeted tax at three nor large North Slope fields. So um, Prudhoe Bay, Kuparik and Alpine. And those actually represent over 80% of our production as a whole in the state of Alaska. It also has other elements in, um, in its two pages. Well, it's only two pages. It's got a lot uh, packed into those, um, but it would it additionally it has um, isolating elements of those North Slope fields. So it addresses ring fencing and stops cash flow between fields. It would require monthly tax returns and for all records, including contractor records to be public. So what are people saying on either side of this issue? Um, on the yes, the Fair Share Act, which is what the nickname for the ballot measure is, um, those supporting the ballot measure passage said Alaskans are not getting a fair share for their oil. Our current tax structure, SB 21, isn't working. It hasn't delivered on jobs, production, or revenue since it was put in place um, back in 2014. That the state is giving away 1.5 to 2 billion per year in tax breaks for the largest and most profitable fields. And that voting yes will create more jobs, save the dividend, uh, permanent fund dividend, and fix our budget issues. On the no side, Ballot measure one goes too far and puts Alaska's economic recovery at risk. Um, that Senate Bill 21 is in fact working and has resulted in more production and revenue despite low oil prices. Um, this credit giveaway, which is too complicated uh, for our conversation probably today, we get really deep into the tax structure, but really it is a misnomer. And um, it, it is the one element in the tax structure that makes our tax rate progressive. Um, so it's really a misnomer and that this change won't solve our budget problems and that voting no will save jobs, keep projects and production growing and protect revenues um, for the permanent fund dividend and the budget. So as you can see, both sides are saying that the goal here is to get more revenue to the state, protect um, essential services through the budget and the permanent fund dividend. So the really it comes down to the questions Alaskans are answering right now is which, which side does that, right? 
So uh, one of the first questions that we ask, that is, I think, being asked by Alaskans is, is our current tax structure, is SB 21 working? So a good way, a good metric to um, assess that is to look at production. So what we see here, this yellow line and this dark blue line show the production um, levels from 2007 to 2013 when the past tax structure was in place, also known as ACEs, we see that there was a pretty strong production decline and that yellow line is what was forecasted to continue. So under the old tax structure, what we experienced in Alaska was a 25% decline in production. And these are actual numbers from the Alaska Department of Revenue. These are not directly from industry. These are from the state of Alaska. And this decline was concerning because it was during a period of record high oil prices. And so while you know you had 13 other oil, of, of the 13 oil um, producing states in, in the United States, Alaska was the only one experiencing massive declines during this period of time. Others were seeing increased investment and increased production. That is where SB 21 came into play. It was quite a debate, it happened um, back in 2013 and uh, was then ratified later by the voters in, excuse me, in 2014. But the, it, um, once it came into place, this is what we see here, this blue line movement is what happened to production under SB 21. So you really went from, while you're still facing natural decline issues, it really went from a decline rate of 6% to a decline rate of 1%. And so, I mean, it was pretty dramatic how we really, um, saw that stem in, 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 in dropping production. And this was remarkably during a period of, during, of low oil prices. As we know in 2015 and 2016, we saw a massive drop in oil price and we're experiencing that again here in 2020. But even in that time, um, because of the adjustment to the tax structure, we were seeing increased investment. We had a record year in 2015 and then the product of that investment. So in FY19, which is the last year that we have actuals for, um, it, you can look at what was forecasted to take place under the old structure and what actually took place in terms of production. And we see that we were 75,000 barrels a day ahead of what was expected. So in that regard, uh, we, you know, that would be one metric where we would say the current tax structure is working despite oil price drops and revenue drops. And because of that, which Alaskans are certainly feeling, including myself, um, we do see that this has been an effective tax structure. And actually we have this quote here. Um, this is from our former commissioner of revenue under our former independent governor, uh, Bill Walker, and really came on the record and said, if you look at it, um, the current tax structure has earned more revenue for the state than the old tax structure would have. And part of that is because um, of how it's designed, it's protecting the state at low prices. And so, um, you know, and not to mention the increase in production. More barrels equals more tax and royalty revenue to the state. So that's really why production matters to the state of Alaska. And uh, we think this tax structure is showing um, effective impacts. Uh, so in terms of the ballot measure, uh, what does that look like um, overall? I, I, you know, the, the ballot measure focuses so much on focuses solely on the production tax, but it's really important to look at the broader picture. So Roger Marks is an independent economist here in Alaska. He worked for decades under Republican and Democratic and independent governors um, for as a petroleum economist. He doesn't always um, land on the side of industry when it comes to oil taxes, but he is very concerned. Um, he's so concerned with this ballot measure that he's actually been volunteering his time to do analysis and pro, pro bono. So he's completely um, not funded by industry um, on this, but he took a look at government take in the competitive boundary. So for, for you know, looking at overall, those, all those taxes and royalties we talked about earlier, what does that look like um, across oil jurisdictions? And what is the competitive uh, boundary, essentially the rate across um, different oil prices? And so this is, this is the line that Roger Marks would say is the competitive boundary. This is kind of where you want to be let me just get all this out here. Okay. And so 
this, sorry, this dotted blue line is where Alaska is currently under our current tax structure. So you really see, while we're not competitive, as competitive everywhere, and as I mentioned, we really go up in that government take at low prices, which is that protection for the state. We do sit in the, very competitively in this range of the sort of $55 to $70 barrel range. Now this yellow line would be where the ballot measure, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself here. This yellow line is where the ballot measure would land us. So arguably a much higher uh, tax, a much higher government take and, and moving further away from, from that competitive boundary. And it represents, that's where we get that 150 to 300% uh, tax increase depending on the price of oil. And then lastly, this gray dotted line, that's, that is uh, representative of the competitive boundary, or excuse me, the government take rates under the last tax structure, ACES. So that's what we're talking about. When we think about that previous slide, that drop, we see that the ballot measure in that yellow line is actually higher tax rate than our old tax rate. And we have a case study in place to see what would happen to production if it were to pass. So I'll just go back here. Again, this is uh, analysis by econ economist Roger Marks. We're looking at $60 a barrel. Um, as you can see, Alaska currently sits sort of in the middle of the pack in terms of competitiveness. These are both domestic and international oil jurisdictions that he's comparing here. And if, um, if looking at government take, if the ballot measure were to pass, uh, Alaska shoots up there right underneath Norway. So it is a significant impact. But let's get real, we're not at $60 a barrel uh, right now. So let's look at $40 a barrel. At $40 a barrel, government take is significant already in Alaska. We are at the top of this pack here in terms of take. And if the ballot measure were to pass, you're looking at uh, a significant adjustment here, way past 100% government take. So what does that mean? That means that um, at these prices at $40 oil, companies are actually paying out more than they're making off of the barrel um, to the government in between taxes and royalties. And that's because, as I mentioned earlier, some um, revenue streams aren't dependent on the price. So it doesn't matter if the price is below 40, they still have to pay those, those tax rates. So what are the economists saying? Let's, let's talk a little bit about that. Um, essentially, the ANCSA, which is the... Uh, Regional Association here for Alaska Native Corporations uh, commissioned a study, and these are just some of the top lines um, that they found it would reduce future investment activity by over 14%, could be risking 6,300 jobs, um, just very puts us very in a, a, a less competitive position than ever before. Um, and, you know, it's not listed here, but IHS Market also got involved. Some of you might be familiar with their very well respected. Um, an analysis firm, and uh, they basically, I'll read their quote from their study, Alaska's fiscal system becomes one of the least competitive oil and gas fiscal systems in the U.S. under ballot measure one. So Alaska's ranking within the international peer group erodes, as well as under the proposed measure. So, you know, unfortunately, the proponents of the measure hadn't provided any economic impact analysis other than what the revenue might look like um, to the state. And, and those economists who have analyzed the measure are finding that it would have significant negative impacts. This slide is actually from the IHS study, um, IHS market study that was done. And it's really interesting because it kind of shows uh, fisc or oil and gas tax policy movements over time in different jurisdictions. So here where you can see is that traditionally, um, so above that line of, of years, there is higher government take and below are policy changes towards lower government take. And Alaska, as you can see in 2016 and 2017, already made moves for higher government take. That's the orange bubbles there. And here in 2020, we are, ballot measure one is literally <laughs> the only oil and gas jurisdiction that at this current time under these prices and this challenging environment is looking at um, increasing government take. So um, we're definitely on our own up here in the state as to um, that movement. So really at the end of the day, Alaska, we have two paths. 
uh, we can certainly vote yes. Uh, we feel that that would move us towards rapid decline, potentially put our legacy fields, our largest fields in harvest mode where we're no longer investing and increasing production or at least maintaining that production. We're not invest in putting investment into new fields and maybe bringing those online to offset that natural decline. Um, or we can vote no, maintain our current tax structure. Um, and right now, as of, of three o'clock yesterday, um, we had 100% of precincts reporting. Of course, not all our early votes or absentees are counted yet, um, but we are optimistic with the results thus far. I'm not ready certainly to call it by any means, but at this point we are leading 64% um, to 35%. So we do think that this is a statement so far from Alaskans that they understand the importance of industry here in the state and they want to maintain um, that viability and the health of the industry because it really does trickle down to individuals, jobs, businesses, and families. And so um, that's kind of where we are with the ballot measure right now. I know um, I was going to kick it over to Christine and she uh, if she wants to take it off, um, take it over. <laughs> on Thanks, global Brooke. Market I really outlook. appreciate that. First of all, I want to thank all of you for allowing us to be here today. And I wish I could be in the, the beautiful city of Seattle with many of you. It is, uh, it would be nice to be traveling, but as, as many of us are not traveling these days. So I wanna, for, before we kind of go into the slides in this next session, I wanna take it back a little bit high level. So everyone knows that we are going through a transition in the world away from hydrocarbons and to lower carbon emissions. And the question really comes to how quickly do we make that transition? And as we're making that transition to support the places that we are producing oil and gas to sustain the competitiveness of the different regions. So obviously living here in Alaska and working in this industry, I have a strong desire to continue to produce hydrocarbons in Alaska. It, it can be a very competitive place to do it. I also think that Alaska does it very safely and it is, we might as well take advantage of what we have left in the ground and continue to benefit our state until such time as the demand isn't there. So that's really the high level sort of overview of where we are, which is, yes, there's a transition. Nobody's arguing with that. And, and everyone's fine with that, but the transition isn't gonna happen overnight. And there are a lot of different opinions, but by and large, there seems to be a pretty, there seems to be a grouping of folks and, and this data, um, it kind of shares that as well, that sometime around 2040, you're gonna to start to see a pretty significant decline or a, a decline, and that you're gonna see an industry that's probably in full decline by 2050. So we're kind of looking at the years between 2020 and 2050, so the next 30 years, and figuring out how Alaska can remain competitive over time, how we might transition our economy, but we're certainly not there today. So if you focus on the left, that top yellow bubble is oil and gas. And, and it's really cut in two pieces. The left half is meant to be sort of today, right before the pandemic, and the right side is, is, is 2040. And so you can see there's still some increase in demand for oil and gas through to 2040. And then you start to see a fall off following that. As you go down natural gas and even bigger amount of growth, I think a lot of folks believe there'll be an, a first transition or transition fuel to natural gas before it go, we go to something that's that's fully carbon neutral or carbon free. And then coal obviously contracting, and then you see some of the renewables down below and you can see that radical growth that we're gonna continue to see well into the future and, and certainly growing quite a bit through 2050. The Energy Information Association for the United States uh, has a graph here on the left. And what you see is continued growth through 2050 for natural gas. You see that decline that I mentioned earlier for crude oil and then you see the growth in the renewables in some of the other areas. Obviously, you also see that decline coming for coal. So that really sets the stage for what are we looking at? We're looking at the next 30 years and we're looking at kind of Alaska and how we remain competitive. So let's put this next graphic in perspective, give or take big round numbers because uh, nobody needs to remember decimal points. We produce about 100 million barrels a day in the United, in the world. There's about a give or take, it's a little over 100 today, but let's stick with round numbers. There's 100 million barrels of oil produced per day in the world. The US produces a little bit over 11 million barrels and you can see Texas is a big piece of that. And we all hear folks talking about the Permian a lot. The Permian encompasses parts of Texas and parts of New Mexico. So Alaska sits sixth today and that orange bubble down a little bit lower. And it, we're producing, give or take, a little under 500,000 barrels a day. Some days it's over, some days it's under. 
Before COVID-19 hit and before we saw the radical decline in oil prices that, that hit in the first quarter of 2020, the, the, the wonderful year we're in right now, we were on a pretty interesting path. And so I'd like to switch to the next slide, Brooke, if you'll, if you'll take me to the next slide. Thank you so much. Um, and that is going to be to transition that slide into Alaska's energy industry and the path forward. So Brooke mentioned that as we went to vote on ballot measure one, we had two choices as a state. One was this concept of decline and harvest mode, because if you don't continue to fix your wells, work your wells over, I call interventions bringing the plumber out for, for a really simplistic way to think about it, and also continue to drill new wells, decline production is gonna go down. If you're not continuing to drill and you're not continuing to fix your wells, invest, right? Basically invest, your production is gonna go down. And as you drill more wells, maintain the wells that you have, production will either stay flat or potentially even increase. So as we all know, um, if you want to flip to the next slide, Prudhoe Bay is an older field. Uh, you know, we've produced billions of barrels of oil out of that field. That's the, uh, the orange field that you see there in the middle. And then we also have two other larger fields, Kapark and Alpine, that are further over to the west. And those are the three core big fields that produce over 80% of Alaska's production. Before we kind of you know, jumped off on this, this world that we are living in now, there was an estimate that we had at least another 14 billion barrels of production in Alaska that we could produce. We had some really exciting projects. The uh, Willow Project way over to the West and then NPRA had the ability to produce well over 100,000 barrels a day once it was up and running. We had the PICA Project that's a combination of oil search and Repsol that had a project that again could produce well over 100,000 barrels a day. And then we had various projects around the field that had great opportunity. Uh, NUNA, which is a project that Conoco is working on developing, the Liberty Field that Hillcorp has, uh, any Spy Island had an expansion planned. And even looking at decline rates, we were it was easy. And not to mention, let's talk about Prudhoe Bay for a minute. Prudhoe Bay has recently changed hands and has a new owner. BP has exited and Hillcorp has become a partner with ExxonMobil and ConocoPhillips. And that opportunity is really exciting. And there are billions more barrels that can be developed in that core field. And one of Hillcorp's goals was to get the cost and is currently they're doing it, is to get the cost of production down in Prudhoe Bay to make that field even more competitive. So with all these projects and even the existing decline rates we have, there is a, was a plan, there is a plan to put over 200,000 incremental barrels of oil down our Trans-Alaska Pipeline, which is the 800 mile pipeline that spans from the North Slope down to Valdez. That's pretty exciting. If you, if you think back to that slide where we were just under you know, 500,000 barrels, we're talking about taking Alaska up to 700,000 barrels. And that's not to say that we're trying to grow overall oil output in the world. It's not to say that we're not contemplating the move that, that we all know is gonna happen to you as a lower carbon environment. But reality is it was keeping Alaska competitive. It is keeping Alaska competitive. So we have a seat at that table. There are some exciting things about Alaska. Um, our wells don't require lots of fracking, little fracks, not huge fracks. And some of them don't get fracked at all. By and large, our wells come on a little bit bigger. Uh, these are traditional fields. These fields don't have the significant decline in the wells that you see in a, in a shale play. So these wells last long. There are a lot of things that make Alaska a really exciting place to produce oil and very competitive. In terms of our logistics, we're very close to Asia. So it's an easy, you know, hop, skip and a jump from, from Valdez over to Asia. Additionally, many of the refineries on the West Coast when they were built were tooled for Alaska's oil and they're very, uh, they like our oil, right? California and, and Washington like our oil because their refineries are structured in a way that it's easier to produce our oil. So if you flip to, uh, well, I guess we've got that. So, so at the end of the day, there is a great opportunity here in Alaska. We have the ability to be competitive if we have a competitive tax structure. And let's talk about competitive tax structure and what that means. I hear a lot of people say, oh, well, the oil companies just want a tax break. No, I, I think the Alaska industry just wants to pay a competitive rate, a fair rate relative to their, their, the other places they're competing against so that we can attract investment. Why do we want to attract investment? We want to attract investment because this is the economy. This is the industry that drives the Alaska economy today. 
uh, we can transition over time, but today this is this is what drives our economy, as, as Brooke very eloquently showed in the previous slides. And when you look at the opportunities we have here, you look at the oil and gas fields that we have here, the future development we have here, this industry in Alaska is fighting to remain competitive. And that's why you saw so much energy around the ballot measure that we talked about earlier. And I'm really excited about the outcome, partially because it was the citizens that went to the polls and voted. And they're voting to support their industry so far, which, which is exciting to me because I always like it when people you know, are, are positive about what we're doing. So I just wanted to kind of set that stage for the Renaissance and what's going on and what potentially can happen on the North Slope of Alaska within our oil industry. Um, now I'm going to turn to slide, um, I guess we're on slide, there we go. And Brooke's going to tell you a little bit about something we didn't talk about, which is ANWR. So everything I told you excluded the, 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 our ANWR potential. And so Brooke, take it away and, and talk, about, talk about ANWR for us. Absolutely. So I'm sure many on this call are very familiar with on, um, ANWR, but um, you know this representative, this orange um, spot on the um, at the top of the North Slope there uh, is called the 1002 area, uh, located obviously in in Northeast Alaska, and it's the, really the largest onshore prospect we have right now in the United States. So uh, conservative estimates are showing six to six billion or six to 16 billion barrels of oil, uh, recoverable, technical recoverable oil there. Um, and, you know, I'll just note that Prudhoe Bay was originally estimated back in 1977 to have 9.6 uh, barrels of recoverable oil. And we, you know, last August, I think we passed 13 bar billion out of uh, Prudhoe Bay and we're still counting. And I know there's at least another 3 billion that, uh, that you know, BP Alaska identified before exiting. So um, there's a lot of, of great potential here. Um, and it's just a few miles from existing development on state lands that are operating um, safely and effectively. So even now, over two thirds of Alaskans uh, support opening ANWR and development there. Um, and there's strong support of those who live um, on that coastline uh, in Kaktovik area. So, um, you know, that's something that I know there's controversy, of course, um, and, and all voices need to be heard, but there are um, sometimes quieter voices of those that live in, in actual plains um, that are supportive. And, you know, really this is the next generation of, of oil and gas. Uh, we won't see production from this area for uh, 12 to 15 years after the lease sale. So, um, you know, as Christine mentioned, uh, there's going to be demand for oil and gas in the long term, um, even as a transition takes place. Um, so yes, we need oil from Anwar in 15 years from now because demand will exist for the next 30 to 40 years. Um, and, and in terms of recent announcements, um, on August 17th of this year, uh, the US Secretary of the Interior signed a record of decision approving a coastal plain uh, oil and gas leasing program for the 1002 area. Um, I will just mention there's strict leasing stipulations uh, covering 60% of the program area, but um, now we're just sitting, uh, waiting for a lease sale. So per the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, uh, two lease sales are to be scheduled. Um, you know, and um, let me see, the first is set to occur, let me see, at the end of next year, so 2021. Um, that has not yet been scheduled. And so that's kind of where this project sits, but I know there's a lot of potential um, in addition to all the other projects on the North Slope. Um, and so we just look forward to seeing uh, that that move forward. Thanks, Brad. Uh, yep. So kind of want to end this section talking about two projects that can potentially even further help the, uh, the economy here in Alaska. These are both projects that I'm not super um, close to, but they're things I wanted to make you aware of, and I'm going to do it at a fairly high level. We are fortunate enough in the audience today to have Mead Treadwell, the former Lieutenant Governor of Alaska, who is also the CEO of Quilac. So I kind of am on the spot here a little bit as I present um, his company with, with him in the audience. So Quilac LNG is a project that really dovetails other things that have been going on in Alaska. So as many of you may have heard for a long time, there's a lot of gas on the North Slope. And we call it stranded gas because today there's no way to get it to market. There have been multiple attempts to build another, a second 800 mile pipeline from the North Slope down to the South and then build a liquefaction plant so that we can then transport that natural gas. 
Alaska is very close to Asia. Asia has a very high demand for natural gas. It makes a lot of sense, but the cost and the, the requirements to get that infrastructure built has been challenging, as, as many of you know that followed this throughout the years. So Quilac has come up with a really innovative idea, which is to put a floating LNG plant on the North Slope of Alaska off the coast, run a pipeline to it, and start to monetize the gas that's on the North Slope to grab a fleet of ice-breaking transport vehicles that will be able to take it to market and can do it competitively. So there is over 32.4 trillion cubic feet of gas on the North Slope. There's people that would argue that could be as big as 100 million or, um, trillion, but let's just go with the 32 trillion for now because it's plenty. And right now, um, there is a, this project that Quilac is proposing would be able to monetize between uh, trans, export between four and eight um, million, I always mess this up, um, million, tri, million tr metric tons per year of LNG. That's, that would be a great project. It would be smaller than what you could transport down the pipeline, but it's probably a great way to start and they can expand over time. The initial feasibility study has been completed and the plan is to begin installing this liquefied natural gas facility that's offshore by 2027. I will open at the end when you guys have questions, if people have further questions about this, definitely we'll, uh, we'll take them. But at the end of the day, what does this do? This takes this big gas field that Alaska has. It's not an oil field, the North Slope is a big gas field. And it finally lets us monetize the gas. Right now we are producing oil from a very giant gas field. And I think people sometimes forget how much gas is really on the North Slope. And if you remember back, to, we talked about the market and the demand. And you know, you know, oil, oil is going to be declining by 2050, the experts tell us, but natural gas isn't. And so this would be a great way to continue the development of this resource. The second thing that I want to talk about briefly is the Alaska Railroad. So if uh, the uh, Alberta to um, Alaska Railroad. So if you uh, flip to the next slide, Brooke. There is a project under, go ahead. I just wanted to make sure you could see that slide. I can. Great. There is a, pro a project underway to create a railway that would connect Alberta to Alaska. As many of you may know, there's already a railway in Alaska, which is the blue line on the left-hand side of this map that goes to Fairbanks and down into the southern part of Alaska, does not go all the way to the North Slope, nor does it obviously have a, a path into Canada or the lower 48, so it's stranded. This would be the potential. This railway would connect the, the lower 48 with Alaska through Canada. It'd be very, very exciting. And it would, it would solve so many problems. It would solve the problem. It would lower the number of days, even if you utilize shipping, you could ship from a different location, right? You can ship straight to, to Alaska and then down, which would lower the number of days it would take to get product to market in the lower 48. It would create infrastructure in the northern part of both Canada and Alaska to lower the cost of goods in those remote locations. It creates a way to, to move goods. It creates, frankly, it would increase, would lower the cost and increase the availability of supplies even to the North Slope. So this, it's kind of amazing that Canada is looking at this. It's also Betsy, did we lose audio? It looks like Christine might be frozen. Apologies all, one moment. Um, well, it looks like Christine is frozen, but still on, so I think 
Give a minute to see if she's popping back on. I'm not sure if there's anything you'd like to add at this point. Not to this slide. I'll text her and see if she knows she's frozen. Betsy, while we're waiting to resolve a situation, you noted there are a couple questions that are queued up. Were those through raised hands? I didn't see anything in the text, in the chat. Um, those are just chats directly to me, so I think we can get to those during the Q&A. I think at this point, we're waiting for Christine Burke, if there's any other slides that you would like to speak to in the time. Um, this was actually our final slide, and I just received word that the power went out at Christie's homes or Christine's home. So she is working on getting back online. But in the meantime, I can try and field some questions if we'd like. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much for this presentation. Uh, definitely some great context and background on uh, ballot measure one, of course. But then also just the general market and the different perspectives on the production slope, the natural gas, and this railway kind of uh, topic. Uh, it, it will be very interesting to hear some of the questions. And so I, I guess I'd like to just start by uh, acknowledging the, the folks that have uh, contacted Betsy to uh, ask permission to ask a question. So Steve Hartman, would you like to take it away initially? Sure. Um... My question relates back to the graph that Brooks showed on the competitive nature of the taxing situation in Alaska. And I know there's been a big effort to defeat this Proposition 1. Uh, my question is, is the industry, is the oil industry in Alaska doing anything to help the state legislature move in a direction to even improve upon SB 21? so that uh, the oil uh, generated out of Alaska can be, compet can be done competitively at all crude price levels. Um, thank you for that question, Stephen. Uh, you know, I think at this point, uh, we're certainly always communicating with the Alaska State Legislature. And I work with legislators uh, quite a bit as an educational resource. We, you know, as AOGA, we maintain that really we understand and respect that it's the legislature's purview to always and responsibility per our constitution to always be looking and ensuring that they're getting the maximum benefit of the resource. And so in terms of continuing to keep Alaska competitive and allow um, you know, that, that production and uh, life to, to grow and, and increase revenue to the state, um, I think at this point, we're just hopeful as an industry that we could keep some stability. So if we could, the tax structure has changed seven times in the last 15 years here in Alaska. And it's one of the most volatile tax structures in, in the world. It's, it's continually moving and it's extremely complex. And so at this point, um, while we're open to talking with the legislature as they need, um, and our, our main request is just to leave it as is and let it and let it continue to work. And hopefully those oil prices uh, bounce back over time and and we can just sort of maintain it and get back to that investment. Sure. Okay. I know it's a continuum. Hi, this is this is Christy. I died of it. I just lost all power at our house. I'm very, very sorry. Hi Christy, welcome back. Pardon? Welcome back. So sorry. Um it's so if I don't know if you if Brooke already covered the uh, the final slides on on the COVID response, but happy to talk about that to the extent that folks want to. I didn't, Christy, Christine. Um, I can pull those back up actually, if we'd like to do that. Yeah, I can honestly say I've never just had all power go out in the middle of a presentation before. Welcome to uh, 2020. <laughs> so, it, well, Brooke is, and I can't see the slides at the moment. Well, Brooke's pulling those up. I just wanted to spend a few minutes talking about COVID-19. We're all in different industries and we've all dealt with it in very different ways. But the, the slope is a unique place. We have thousands of people working in remote camps in isolated close quarters. You may even want to, you know, a little bit equate it to the fishing industry, which, which Washington obviously has a lot of experience with. So the oil and gas industries was deemed critical workforce. 
we didn't have to stop our operations, which was, which was good, right? But we had to figure out how to manage it. So initially what we did was we made sure that people kept health logs of their temperature. We didn't have any way initially of figuring out whether somebody did or didn't have COVID. So we, we put in really good social distancing metri- measures across the whole slope. People weren't eating in dining rooms. People were staying six feet apart. We would put people across the industry, depending on the different companies and pods, so that if there was an outbreak, we were able to keep it isolated. We set up specific camps even so that people could be isolated in a location and not take the risk of infecting others. And then we also created situations where we could get people off planes, onto planes that were just, you know, planes that had been taken care of for folks that potentially had COVID to get them back off that isolated environment. Because what we were trying to avoid was to have a situation where we had a mass outbreak, where we had, you know, multiple people in a, in a small work group. The good news is the industry overall in Alaska has had an extremely positive overall outcome with COVID. There have been very few cases in the slope. We've seen an uptick recently, and I think it's because if you look at the statistics in Alaska, Alaska has had a really substantial increase up to kind of three to 400 cases a day the last four weeks. And we're starting to see that in our workforce, but it tends to be spotty here and there and not, we haven't had sort of a massive outbreak in one location, which I think speaks to what our folks have done. So there's a really strong safety culture in the oil and gas industry. And there's even an accept, an even stronger safety culture within the Alaska oil and gas industry because of the remote work environment and because of the risk. And so we really just capitalize on that safety culture in order to make sure that we were able to control COVID. And so people take it very seriously. People are really just taking this as seriously as they take what they do every day in their jobs and the risks that, that are out there. So social distancing, recognizing meetings happen, have to happen in a different way, doing things differently, closing gyms, again, keeping the, 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 the food locations either closed or or people distancing while they're eating so that people are staying six feet apart. Just recently, we've been able to add a really great sort of secondary precaution, which is we have started as an industry testing folks for COVID on a rapid test before they go to the slope. So they get to the airport, they get their COVID test before they go to, to work. And the work, we are seeing people testing positive at the airport, not a ton, but some. And they're, they're testing positive that are in their completely asymptomatic. And so what that's now doing is it's completely eliminating those folks from getting to the slope. So I think the industry as a whole is very excited about adding the rapid testing element to our, uh, to our processes. And that I think will continue to keep us safe, even in an environment where, like I said, our local region here in Alaska has seen a tremendous uptick in COVID cases in the last four weeks. So with that, I, uh, I'm finished and I open it up for questions. Oh, George, be sure to unmute yourself, please. Yes. Uh, thanks very much, Christine and Brooke. Uh, and Christine, way to be an Alaskan and kind of hang in there and figure a way out. So that was great. So uh, I think we've got another question that's queued up from Jason Brantley. Uh, Jason, would you like to unmute yourself and ask a question? Sure, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. I can. Um, I, it, I had a question about ANWR, and I think both addressed it. I didn't know if they wanted to, you know, either panelists wanted to elaborate, given it looks like there'll be a change in administration, uh, you know, how they view that. And, you know, you talked about several new potential exciting projects on the North Slope and the natural gas terminal. Uh, you know, where maybe you could sort of prioritize those. Would some of those projects maybe come ahead of a potential uh, ANWR project given some of the political challenges with ANWR? Um, so maybe just kind of throwing some of those topics out for the two panels. Thanks for doing this, appreciate it. No worries. So I'm gonna take this first and then pass it to Brooke. So I think the last part of your question is, is I'm gonna answer first, which is a resounding yes. I think there are a number of projects on the North Slope that will happen long before um, what happens. You know, the um, Willow has received its record of decision, which is on the far left, uh, the far west side of the field. It's a, it's a project that's being developed 
by Conoco. And I think you will definitely see, though, the, if you think back of the slide where I had said the Alaska Renaissance, I think you're going to see some of those projects definitely coming to market well before Anwar. And I, there, I think, you know, it remains to be seen what happens with the administration change and what isn't isn't possible. I'm certainly optimistic that we'll, we'll be able to unstrand gas in, in Alaska because we need to, right? But the world needs that gas and it's just in the right location. And I think, I think Anwar is a very sensitive topic and I'll turn it back to Brooke. And I'm, I'm not sure where we'll end up. I don't know that anybody is. Um, thank you. And thank you for the question, Jason. And, and it is a very topical one. Certainly, I think there's political realities at play. Um, you've got, uh, you know, Joe Biden, who has stated on um, in writing and, in, and verbally, uh, you know, regarding a, a potential ban on future leases on federal land, a uh, potential ban on uh, future permitting. And that, that one in particular, I think, is concerning for Alaska. You know, Christine just mentioned the Willow Project. Well, it hasn't been fully permitted yet in the, in the NPRA, the Natural and Petroleum Reserve. So, uh, you know, there's, there are projects that might occur uh, further in advance or take priority or be, uh, you know, closer on our timeline of production. But it, it will be potentially impacted by policy moving forward, depending on who takes this uh, to, takes the presidency. But again, I think uh, looking at the dramatic impacts of oil and gas on Alaska's economy, the way that we're currently structured, there will be some um, realistic conversations that need to take place about, uh, you know, what might happen to Alaska should those move forward. And so, um, you know, that answers part of your question. I think uh, in terms of um, you know, participation or pace or priority of ANWR, I, I do think, you know, right now is a challenging time or there may be other um, higher priorities on the slope of projects. Uh, but I don't think that, the, you know, companies will be um, not making the decision on whether or not uh, to bid an ANWR uh, based on current markets. They'll be looking at, you know, 12 to 15 years from now. And so that's just something, you know, it's really hard to say. No one can really speculate on um, company participation in a lease sale should it occur next year. Uh, but that would, that's probably, they'll be looking forward. I mean, the life of a project is long. So um, they may be able to do all of the above. I don't know, we hope. So um, I don't know if that answers your question, but happy to, to clarify further if needed. Jason, are you good? Can we press to another one? Yes, that was great. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. It takes a while to do all the unmuting. I know. Uh, well, I'll tell you. And then they toggle on and off randomly, it seems like. So I, I do have a, a question. Uh, I really appreciated uh, the, the comment uh, that, that was made about uh, Hillcorp in terms of a priority for them in terms of driving down the cost of production. And so if we if we thought about the whole, I don't know if the ecosystem is the right word, but the process of you know exploring, extracting, getting it ready to put in the pipeline, moving it down the pipeline, putting it uh, in storage, and then putting it in the ships, and then getting it out to the refineries. If we look at that whole chain, uh, we, we talked about the need to be investing in the wells and the, the fields in general. Are there any other aspects uh, of that system that need to be, that deserve to be getting attention so that we're not putting you know, a, a critical link in the chain at risk. Brooke, do you want to start or do you want me to? Well, I was just gonna say the one thing, one thing that comes to mind and this may not be directly related, but um, one thing that I think is missed sometimes is we talk about that midstream, that transportation piece down the pipeline and just taking those, um, factors into account. So we, to, to effectively operate the pipeline in certain weather, we need to have, you know, a certain amount of oil flowing through that um, as, and, and that's changing over time, um, you know, with technology, um, we can reach lower levels of, you know, barrels of oil going through the pipeline, but um, also on top of that costs of transporting a barrel. And I think what's lost sometimes um, is that, you know, talking about this ballot measure again, if we um, 
have fewer barrels going down due to lower production caused by tax policy change, that actually increases the amount per barrel cost to transport that down the, um, down the pipeline. And that affects uh, other companies or smaller players who are um, also operating on the North Slope and um, producing oil and that's being transported down the pipeline. That's raising their costs as well um, as, as individual companies. So it's just something to think about. There's a lot of symbiotic relationship up on the slope in terms of infrastructure between newer and older fields. And, um, you know, it's not always the big the big oil or the big three that, that Alaskans sometimes think of. Um, as, as the only ones affected by something like this ballot measure. So I'll just say that. And then Christine, you probably have a lot more to say on that topic. Yeah, so as many of you may know, the Alaska is the organization that manages the Trans-Alaska Pipeline. And not to say that that is the only area of opportunity. The answer is there is opportunities for innovation in this whole entire industry and in this chain. And there is a lot going on across the industry and across Alaska to find those efficiencies and make sure that we're doing it safely, reliably, and maintaining the infrastructure that we have. I'm personally involved in a project right now with Alaska as they're looking at opportunities for innovation. Uh, our organization coincidentally does manage, has the operations contract for the entire Trans-Alaska pipeline. So work very closely with it. So the answer to that is a very loud yes. And, the, and I thought it was really good that Brooke mentioned teamwork and working together. There was a lot of infrastructure already built in Alaska both the fact that the pipeline exists, the docks in Valdez, the system for getting oil you know, out of Alaska and on its way, but also on the slope, all the roads and all the remote facilities in those Arctic conditions. And the more we share, the lower the costs get. And Brooke you know, raised a really interesting point on cost. So <clears throat> you know, it's a little over $4 a barrel to get a barrel of oil down the Trans-Alaska pipeline. That's a cost that's much higher than most other locations and anything we can do to safely lower that cost is an opportunity for the industry. So very insightful question. Christine, how much did you say it costs per barrel to get it down the pipeline? I'm giving you a generalization and I wouldn't sort of, but give or take, it's in the ballpark of north of $4 a barrel, depending on where it's coming from, depending on the production that given day, there's, there's a lot of variables, but it's, it's in the ballpark of $4. And it can get up to 10 here. It just depends on all the factors at play in the, in the price of oil and movements. So, yep. And my number does not include any transport costs once it gets to Valdez. That is solely just the pipe. Thank you. That's, that's really helpful to understand. You know, I'm an engineer and I, I work on heat transfer and pumping and things like that. So I always wonder what we can do to help, help in terms of those things. So in terms of, uh, other questions, does, uh, we've, we've got the chat available for people. I, I have a, a couple of questions of my own, but I wanna make sure I'm not uh, preoccupying everybody with my questions. So I, uh, let me just kind of offer a chance. So if you do have a question, go ahead and speak out. Uh, if, if not, uh, I'll, I'll ask uh, one other question that I have. Uh, George, can I ask a question? Sure, Mead. Yeah. Uh, me tread, I'm walking the dog, uh, but uh, so I'm not on video. But uh, the question is uh, for both participants and actually yourself is what kind of plan do you think Alaska needs to have to protect its industry and be in touch, be in front of uh, climate change technology, you know, uh, uh, carbon sequestration, removing carbon from natural gas, new ammonia technologies. Um, LNG for vessels, bunkering, and so forth. And is there any kind of locus of this uh, where the industry has thought about it together, uh, the university's thought about it together? What what can we do to, it's not a question of being woke on the subject, but being just very much aware of technologies other others may employ to extend the fossil fuel market where, uh, where I don't think Alaska has a strategy. So that's my basic question. So, Mead, I think it's an outstanding question. I will tell you, as you, I think, know, many of the companies that are working in Alaska are now working through what their carbon strategy is. I mean, some of the low-hanging fruit is obviously reducing the amount of hydrocarbons utilized to actually extract oil and gas. That's a simple one. And I think the fields that survive the next 30 years, to your point, are going to have to show that they're either carbon neutral 
where they're working towards carbon neutral or they're working to be, a, I think you're going to have to be competitive in a cost standpoint. And I think you're also going to have to be competitive from a carbon production standpoint as we move from now to 2050. And so I think you raise a really, really good question. And I think it's a focus area that the industry needs to make top of mind to continue to be successful. All right, I had a related question. Uh, this is John Reeves, Elliott Bay Design Group. Um, it was mentioned that you know on the 30, 40 year time horizon um, that there needs to be a transition to you know what's the future economy of Alaska. And I'm wondering, is there an opportunity to continue with that vein of natural resources, um, can we transition to, to something else? What is there already thoughts about what that new industry might be? I'm thinking in terms of offshore wind, I'm thinking tidal power, I mean, the, the huge tidal um, range in Southeast Alaska, for example, to me is a, a great place um, to take advantage of that natural resource. There's an industry associated with that, with uh, manufacturing and maintenance and everything else. Um, I'm curious if the uh, what the future thoughts of what that new industry might be for Alaska. So I think you've just come up with a really, really great session for the chamber here. Um, sounds like, sounds like you've got the, the agenda plan for next month. Okay. Um, I, I seriously, right. I mean, it's a long, I mean, I will, the one thing I will say is there is a tremendous amount of mining resources in Alaska. And I think there's a lot that can be done in the state. And I think that's a great, I think, I think Alaska is going to have to come up with what that is. I think that's a, uh, it's an insightful question, and the answer, I think, is there's lots of things, and mining is certainly one of them. Brooke, take, take it away. I was just going to say, from uh, you know, experience at the state legislature as well as in the industry now, I think you know, we spent 40 years focusing on um, Alaska Natural Gas Pipeline and trying to make that pencil out, and, that, and that's still of interest here. Um, but you know, it would just the gas would need to be marketable. Um, we need to get those contracts in place, and so I, I think we have a lot of work to do in terms of other options to diversify, as you mentioned. So I was just going to agree with you, Christine. Okay, thanks. So, so I, I have a, a question. I, I think that we had our, our power glitch thing as we were uh, trying to talk through the uh, Alaska to Alberta railway aspect. Uh, my understanding is that part of the concept is that some of the freight that might be on that train could be uh, bitumen or other materials that are coming from oil, oil fields or resources in Alberta going through Alaska uh, to get out to a market. Uh, could you guys talk about uh, how that impacts uh, both operations elsewhere in the state what are the synergies that we might be able to harness uh, in, in that regard in terms of like investment in overall infrastructure in that what's called a road belt area? Thoughts? So, I mean, <clears throat> you think about, you know, Valdez when it was developed to go with the Trans-Alaska Pipeline, it was developed for a much larger amount of production. At one point, Alaska had 2 million barrels per day going through the Trans-Alaska Pipeline. So anything we can do to leverage infrastructure lowers costs. We just talked about the cost to produce a barrel or to transport a barrel of oil down the Trans-Alaska Pipeline. My number again stopped it before shipping. But if you add that component in, it, it, it gets much larger, right? So anything you do to increase volume lowers costs per, per amount. And if you look at the logistics, there's definitely benefit to being able to utilize Alaska's southern shores for, for distribution of, of energy. So I think I think it's positive. I think it's, there are so many, we, you know, I, you're right, I did get cut off. There's so many opportunities to not have Alaska be stranded and to have a way to, to, to be able to get goods between the lower 48 and Canada and Alaska. It opens up so many doors that both directions that I think, I think it's something that we really have to keep looking hard at, even though it's an expensive proposition. It's, it solves many of our problems. Thank, thank you. Uh, Brooke, did you have anything or, or good? All right. Well, I guess I'd, I'd like to, at, at this point, uh, unless there's a, another particular question that we want to have addressed, uh, let's, let's go ahead and bring ourselves to closure here. Uh, I wanted to just thank both of you for joining us today, uh, overcoming some of the challenges that we have. Uh, in terms of that connectivity. And this is a, an important, timely, and uh, in some cases, a sensitive kind of topic. We appreciate the way you, you dealt with this. Uh, and close the Q&A as, uh, aspect of our meeting right now and just 
I'll pass the talking stick back to Betsy for some final remarks as we look forward to the future. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, George. Um, and once again, I want to thank our speakers, Brooke and Christine. Thank you so much for joining us today during such a hectic week. Appreciate your time and appreciate everyone hopping on here today for our forum. And of course, to our trustee MC, George Rowe, for helping us out today. Thank you, George. And one last thank you to our series sponsor, Alaska Airlines, for sponsoring today's event. So we are taking a break over December. So I hope that you all mark your calendars and join us for Friday, January 8th for what's next on Alaska's economic report. Um, we're gonna be hearing from our friend, Neil Freed, who is an economist, and then also missing Butebe. So it'll be a great session. Be sure to sign up um, on seattlechamber.com. So that is it. Thank you all. Have a great rest of your Thursday, and we'll see you next time. Take care.